at the bottom, apparently. The bottom. Gotcha. Thank yep. you. I think it, it should be going now. Um, great. So, yeah, I'm very excited to participate in this uh, seminar and this dialogue with Yaron and with everyone else about um, the early universe and Jewish mysticism. So, um, let's get started. So, um, the, the big question that um, we're, we're going to be talking about today is why is there something rather than nothing? And um, so just right off the bat, so we don't, we don't have a great answer. We don't have a satisfying answer. We have clues and we have hints and we have a lot of math and equations um, and experiments, um, but you're not going to leave today um, you know, with an answer like, oh, okay, now I get it, right? And I think that feeling is very common when we're talking about uh, you know, math or physics, but also when we're talking about religion, that there aren't really easy answers um, you know, to, to some of the important questions that we'd really like to know, <laughs> that we'd really like to know more about. Um, so obviously, um, uh, the, the sort of reading, the introductory reading was, there was a New York Times article um, called Why the Big Bang Produced Something Rather Than Nothing. Um, how the universe, how matter gained the edge over antimatter in the early universe? Maybe just maybe neutrinos. Um, so uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about that um, uh, today. And it's not required reading, but um, hopefully you did it because it's a really fascinating article. Um, and there was a companion article from uh, Nature, uh, which is a scientific journal, um, sort of a more technical. Uh, introduction to the same subject matter. Um, and uh, let's see, someone else is joining in. So um, I think, you know, the, the pedant in me and the scientist in me wants to know when we say, you know, why is there something rather than nothing or whatever, why, why, what do we mean when we say matter or what do we mean when we say something? So we're going to we're going to talk about what matter means as as the stuff around us buildings air people the earth itself and also like stars and planets stuff in outer space um so so to get even a little more more precise i mean things that are made of atoms and kind of things that are made of subatomic particles like if you break apart an atom in like a nuclear reactor or whatever you are you aren't destroying matter you're just changing you're just breaking it apart into smaller pieces um, so, so once, you know, in your head, you're like, all right, let me think of all the things I know, right? There's stuff, but there's also like light or heat or energy. Um, you know, uh, my wife, Jamie likes to say, what about love? Um, and so, you know, I'll, I, I won't give you a, a, a hard and fast answer. I'll say it's debatable whether that stuff should count as matter or whatever. Certainly they're all real. Light is real energy is real, heat is real, you know, we, we, we rely on these things, we use them, they're valuable. Um, but I'll also say, like, if we're trying to ask, like, why is there something in the universe and not nothing, like, would you be happy if the universe only had light, heat, and energy in it, and no, no stuff? You know, I, so I, I think, you know, from that, from that point of view, it's not, I'm not trying to be, like, rigorous or, you know, give you an equation or whatever, but just if we're going to talk about matter, we should talk about the stuff that we actually mean, the stuff that makes us up and the stuff that makes the earth up. So that's what I really mean when I talk about matter. And if you do want to get into it, there is a, a distinction, like from in the physics world, we do, it's not just arbitrary, um, but I'm trying to motivate it. So, okay, so... So a lot of the stuff in the universe is matter. Um, some, of this, some of the universe is light and heat and energy. And I'm gonna introduce a third thing, which most people don't think about very much, um, which is called antimatter. Um, antimatter is not an old ancient idea, at least in, in, in physics. Um, it was discovered sort of out of nowhere, um, first theoretically and then experimentally in the, in the 20s and 30s, uh, 1920s and 30s. Um, so it's a rather young idea, and we're still learning a lot about antimatter today. Um, and and so uh, so what is it? So so normally in in um, well so okay so every matter particle so like an an atom or an electron um, or a proton. I'm going to interrupt. I'm sorry. That yes. bunch of cats. 
Um, apparently someone is eating. Um, if everyone would please mute yourselves, check your microphone, make sure you're on mute um, because the eating is um, distracting some people. So please make sure you're muted. I checked the participants list. It was someone who was on their phone so they didn't have the same kind of mute button. So uh, I just muted them as the host. Rabbi Shira, I'm gonna make you a co-host so that, so that you can, um... oh, there is no co-host. Okay, never mind. Okay, so yeah, so every type of particle that you can think of, which is maybe only a couple particles or whatever, they have, an an they have a, a partner particle, which is called an antiparticle. Um, I like to think of it as like Bizarro World and Superman, if you know, so like Superman fights for good and Bizarro fights for evil and they have like different powers and whatever. Um, and Superman can travel to Bizarro universe where everything is backwards um, and the opposite. Um, and, and so antimatter is kind of like that. And, and you can pretty much do anything with antimatter that you can do with matter. So uh, we, as, as scientists, we have made anti atoms and we have like, you know, trapped them in a, in a container um, for, you know, uh, 15 or 20 minutes. Um, we can analyze whether they reflect light the same way as, as, as regular atoms do. Um, one common question is, do antimat does antimatter feel anti-gravity? Um, and we've actually done experiments, and antimatter feels regular gravity. So every, all, all matter and antimatter is all attractive. Um, and and when, when we first discovered antimatter, um, we started measuring all its properties, and we found that they all were equal and opposite. To matter, so so well, so they all weighed the same because we don't have we don't have anti gravity, um, but they have like the opposite electric charge, um, for example, um, and all sorts of stuff like that. But now we know that matter and antimatter are not exactly the same; they do behave slightly differently. Um, and and this talk is about the differences between matter and antimatter. Um, and, and as you're holding your breath, I'm just gonna warn you that the differences are really subtle and really complicated and usually involve lots of math. So I'm gonna do my best, um, but there's gonna be kind of a lot of buildup. And then the conclusion, again, might not be that satisfying. So I'm just gonna warn you that you're kind of gonna have to take my word that there are some differences, uh, but we'll, we'll talk about them. So uh, let's learn a little bit more about antimatter before we keep going. So, so um, you might have heard about this from reading Angels and Demons, um, but what happens when it matter and antimatter meet? Um, so the, the, the technical term is annihilation. Um, and what that means is that both particles disappear, um, or if you have a lot of particles, they all disappear, and in their place is radiation. Um, and usually that means gamma rays, but in principle it could be other other sort of fast moving energetic particles, subatomic particles. Um, okay, and I drew this little cartoon of a particle and antiparticle coming in and then radiation coming out. So, so that's normally what happens when matter and antimatter meet. Um, and you might also be wondering, well, how do you make antimatter if, if we're you know, sitting here on earth and we don't see you know, objects just flying into each other and falling apart into radiation, how do you, how, where do we find antimatter? How do we make it? Um, and again, I'll give you the technical term. The technical term is pair production. Um, and, and it means basically what it means in English that you make a pair of a particle and an antiparticle. Um, and you have to do that by starting with a lot of energy. So usually that looks like gamma rays or some other, like I said, subatomic particles that you collide at each other in like a particle accelerator. This happens in outer space sometimes. Um, and the, the radiation disappears and in its place is a pair of a particle and antiparticle. Um, and, and again, the way I'm talking about it as pairs implies like a balance. And again, for a long time, we thought that this always had to happen in a balanced way, where it was always one particle and one antiparticle. Um, but now we know that there are some situations which are very rare where the balance is broken. Um, so um, also I drew a cartoon and the cartoon probably looks familiar. Um, it looks basically like the opposite of annihilation. So if you were to take one cartoon and run it in the opposite direction of time, you know, run it backwards, record it and play the video backwards, then you would get the other process. So pair production, annihilation, opposites. Um, and just a fun fact, which I learned while I was researching this talk, lightning is powerful enough to make antimatter. So we have satellites that are in space that are looking for gamma ray radiation from outer space, um, like from other planets or galaxies or whatever, but they also detect the gamma rays 
that are produced from annihilations that are that happen when lightning produces antimatter. So um, you know, the more you know. Um, okay, so I've talked a lot about this balance, and I've kind of given away a little spoiler or whatever. But but you know, if everything is balanced in the universe, then why? don't we live on a planet that's half matter and half antimatter? Or if you're thinking you know, one step ahead of the game, why is it that the matter in the universe and the supposedly equal amount of antimatter have annihilated and that we just have light, heat, and energy, which I, which I so cleverly referenced at the beginning of the talk to not really be very helpful if we're trying to build a universe. Um, so this was a big question in, in physics for a long time, and it's still one of the big questions. If you go on Wikipedia to the list of unsolved problems in physics, this is like you know a big one, um, and it's still on that list. We still don't have a solid answer. Um, so I think you know if we're going to talk about how our universe ended up this way, it would be useful to uh, you know give you a simplified history of the universe according to uh, physics. Now I, I know most, if not all, of you have a pretty good idea of the history of the universe according to Judaism or according to Christianity or whatever. Um, in the beginning, there was nothing, right? God created the heavens and the, and the earth and, and, and land and water and light and dark and whatnot. So I'm gonna try to go through a similar narrative, um, but obviously it's not gonna, it's not gonna be the same. Um, the fact that it's not the same is, is you know, the subject of a lot of political controversy in our country for some reason around education and, and the role of government and religion and whatnot. But, um, you know, bear with me on this. Um, so in the beginning, right, um, uh, in, in physics, in the beginning, it's not that there was nothing. In the beginning, there was a lot. Um, the universe was very tiny. We think of the universe today as vast, but in the beginning, the universe was very tiny. All the matter, all the light, all the energy was crammed in a very, very tight space. Um, and as you start cramming stuff together, it gets more dense and it gets more hot. So the universe was very hot and very dense and very small. Um, and I put all these numbers, usually when people write big numbers, they say like a million, billion, billion, billion or whatever. And I think that distracts from how big the number actually is. So I like writing out all the zeros. Um, but I also put the scientific notation at the bottom if you're, if you're trying to keep score. So when I said very hot, I really did mean very hot. It was for a very short time though, um, a, a tiny fraction of a second. Um, and that's kind of as far back as our theories are able to predict and as far back as we could sort of ever conceivably uh, do, you know, measure uh, uh, evidence from. So um, after that very tiny fraction of a second, um, uh, something very interesting happened, uh, a very powerful force we don't really know what, what the force was, um, but we know that it starts applying an outward pressure to everything that's in the universe. So all of us, so, so uh, people talk about this sometimes like a balloon expanding. Um, I like to think of it as bread dough rising or like when you're baking bread or a cake, how it all expands in all directions, right? Um, and I like that because it's three dimensional, right? A balloon is a balloon, the surface of a balloon is two dimensional but bread is three dimensional. So inside there's these bubbles that force the dough apart, right? And in, in between the dough, there's, there's I mean, in, in bread it's air, but in the universe it would be empty space, right? So empty space is appearing and forcing all the matter and, and, and you know, radiation and whatnot and antimatter apart. Um, and, and again, we don't know what this force is or why, where it came from or why it decided to start pushing, that's like an open question in physics research. Um, and it was a very, it was, it's hard to overstate how powerful and quick this force happened. So everything got pushed apart, not like bread dough where it doubles in size over an hour or two or whatever. Um, in, in this case, the universe, you know, expanded by a factor of, of one followed by 26 zeros. So a billion, 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 whatever right? And, and, and again, a tiny, tiny fraction of a second. So everything that was very close together, imagine like a particle of DNA, which, you know, wasn't around in the early universe. It was too hot. But a particle of DNA would have been stretched from here to the nearest star um, in a tiny fraction of a second. So that's, so now all that stuff that was in the universe is now very far apart. Most of the universe is empty space. Um, and there's like an occasional, you know, relic particle 
that you know survived inflation. Um, and and luckily, the universe is only empty space for a very short, again for a very short amount of time. Everything happens really fast early on. Um, so almost as soon as inflation ends, you got to think. What happens to that force? Whatever is causing that force, you know, is very powerful, right? And it doesn't just go away. Stuff that you can't just, you can't just, you know, make something disappear, right? It's got to, it's got to go somewhere. That force, and when it shuts off, it it basically dumps all its energy that it had into the universe as heat and radiation. Um, and this process is called reheating. Um, so, so whereas there used to be empty space and, and this inflation thing going on. Now there's space that's full of all the energy that whatever was causing inflation has to, has to get rid of somehow, okay? So, so it's gamma rays, but it's also all, all sorts of other types of particles, radiation. Um, we don't, you know, in, in, in the Science Times or whatever, they don't really talk about like the other forms of radiation, but maybe you've heard of like alpha, beta, and gamma radiation um, from like your high school chemistry class. So it's stuff like that. It's just all sorts of hot particles that aren't forming clumps because they're so hot, they're so energetic, they're just whizzing around, um, banging into each other and whatnot. So, so you can think of it like a, like a hot plasma um, uh, of, of basically vaporized matter and antimatter um, all over the place. And now we're going to get back to, we're going to start reviewing those earlier slides, right? What happens when there's a lot of matter and antimatter together? Um, they start annihilating and pair producing because they're so energetic. So, so at this stage, there's a balance because there's the annihilations and the pair production and they're kind of, everything's so hot, there's enough energy going around that they're just balanced out. So, so on average, you're not gaining more matter and you're not gaining more antimatter. They're just, you know, so this matter annihilates with that antimatter and then somewhere else in the universe, there's some radiation that pair produces. Sam, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Are you saying that antimatter existed prior to inflation or that it was created post-inflation due to the gamma ray radiation? That's a really good question. That was actually um, uh, you know, the subject of a lot of heated um, debate before inflation was produced. Before inflation, we thought that, that there was a more gradual expansion. And the key feature of inflation is that it was so rapid and so uh, extreme. And so basically the idea is that whatever was around before inflation is probably not anywhere near us right now because it was stretching space so quickly and so fast. So everything that we have today, including everything from reheating, the, all that matter, all that antimatter was created from the energy that, was, that, that inflation gave up. So it was only around after inflation. Um, yeah, and so there's that, that feature, inflation is basically used to solve a lot of questions like that. So for example, some people, uh, uh, some people, in physics, we think that there should be some other kinds of particles out there, subatomic particles, that we don't in practice see. We don't see them anywhere in the universe that we've looked, you know, from our telescopes or from on Earth or anything like that. And people wondered for a long time, where, where, where are they? What happened to them? And one explanation is that they were created before inflation and so now they're just so far away and so, you know, so few and far between because inflation stretched them out to be so far away from everything else. Um, so that's like a fun little, uh, it's almost like, like a contrived situation or whatever, but it works and, we, and, and, and so we, we, we use it. Um, yeah, so the antimatter was created along with matter after inflation in equal amounts. Um, but but then, and in the timeline, this is sort of approximately when we think this happened, extra matter is created somehow. And again, I told you it wouldn't be satisfying, right? But I said there were all these differences between matter and antimatter, and they're very small and very subtle. Like I said, it took people a while to, to, to figure out that they even existed, that, that matter and antimatter weren't exactly the same. Um, and we found differences in a couple different types of interactions with a couple different types of particles. And, you know, uh, they're very, some of them are very uh, dramatic and some of them are very s subtle. You just have to know where to look. Um, but um, we can add up all the differences and say, all right, well, you know, since we observe this system different to like 1%, then, then that means that we should have this much extra matter in the early universe. And you can go through and do the calculation 
it's like a rather complicated calculation, so I'm not putting it here. Um, but you can see how, many, how much extra matter should we end up with. Um, and, and so I said, let me count the ways. So let me, let's count all the ways that matter and antimatter are different. There's one way in the K system. There's one way in the B system. There's one way in this system. There's one way in the other system. And we add them all up, and it's not enough. All the ways that we know that matter and antimatter are different is not enough to create all the extra matter that we see today. Um, so mystery, right? So, so, so um, what happened? And when I mean extra matter, I mean, today we only see matter, right? So, so what do I mean extra? Like, it's just, it's an amount that you're comparing to zero. And what we really, we compare the amount of matter to the amount of radiation. Because we know that matter and antimatter, when they combine, they form radiation, right? They annihilate to radiation. So if there's, if there's a lot of radiation and only a little bit of matter, that means that, that, was a very, that, that there was a lot of antimatter and matter that annihilated to form all that radiation. Whereas if there was only a little bit of radiation and a lot of matter, that would mean there was only a little bit of antimatter that annihilated because there's only a little bit of radiation. Now. But, but in fact, we see a lot of radiation compared to how much matter we have. So there was a lot of antimatter and a lot of matter, only a little bit of imbalance, but even still not enough. You know, not enough the ways that we know of to, to create that imbalance. So uh, I'm, in, I'm intentionally not putting numbers to it because I didn't want to like overwhelm everyone with numbers, but we can go and look at the numbers if you want to know those numbers. Um, okay, so I'm going to continue on. So like I said, annihilation, we got this mystery. This is the big mystery, so keep this in your head, right? Um, annihilation. So like I said, when everything is really energetic, the pair production and the annihilation balance out. But eventually, you know, kind of as an aftermath of the inflation, the universe is still kind of expanding, just not as fast, right? It's kind of just plodding along in its expansion. And so it's cooling down very slowly. Um, and, and eventually, um, as it expands and as it cools, uh, annihilation can still happen because it can happen to anything, any, you know, any matter finds any antimatter, no matter how energetic, but the pair production stops happening because the, the, all the particles that are whizzing around, they, when they bump into each other, it's not like a big explosion anymore. It's just that they bump into each other and they bounce off. And so you don't get new matter, new antimatter. You, you, you get whatever you, whatever you started with again. Um, and so when this happens, you know, once the temperature gets low enough and the energy gets low enough, all the matter that finds antimatter, it, there's no undoing process anymore. So it finds the antimatter, it annihilates, and just whatever's left is whatever's left. And so that's whatever's left over after that is all the matter that we know about today. All the stars, all the planets, us, everything is just whatever was left over after this annihilation. Um, and again, all, all that extra radiation from the annihilation that we can measure today. Okay, I'm going to go through the next parts rather quickly. It's just sort of more for, for your, um, your education about what happened in the early universe or whatever. So the universe is still very hot at this point, right? I use the word like cool down or whatever. I really mean like, you know, out of the frying pan into the fire, like maybe slightly less hot, maybe a little bit better or whatever. Um, and, and so now the energy is too low. You can't pair produce, but you can still break apart atoms. You can still smash apart atoms. So any kind of atom that tries to form, it very quickly gets broken up um, into its constituent particles again. But like I said, the universe is still cooling down, um, you know, rather slowly, but still cooling down. And after 300,000 years, 400,000 years, now we can start getting into real numbers, right? Um, it's so cool that you can take an atom and all the, all the radiation around it isn't enough to break it up. Um, so now we actually start having atoms. And, and so these atoms are just, it's just gas um, because it's still like, you know, above the boiling point, for example, of all the different elements that are forming. Um, but now at least we have atoms. So that's like really cool. Right now we have atoms. Um, and it's at this point also that light, you know, the radiation, the gamma rays, that light can move around again without smashing into stuff and, 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 and getting, you know, messing up, getting reflected, getting absorbed or whatever. So the earliest light that we've ever been able to observe with a telescope comes from this time, from 380,000 years after the start of the universe. Um, and and I, one, of, one, of my, one of my friends from grad school who I invited to this talk, I don't know if he's here because I can't see the list, but he like works on the telescope that, that studies this kind of thing. Hey, Sam. Oh, hey, Charlie. 
he's here. Great. Um, okay, so so Charlie, correct me if I said anything wrong. Um, so after atoms form, then obviously the next step is stars and galaxies. The rest of the rest of the stuff that we know about today. Um, and and basically the idea is, you know, you have all these atoms, but they're still very energetic. And if they try to form together into like a rock or you know try to get together to a star, it's still it's too hot. It's too hot, you know, and, and they just get smashed to pieces when they, try to, when they try to come together. But again, eventually the universe cools down even more and more and more. Um, and so this is like, you know, hundreds of millions of years after the start of the universe. So it takes a long time. But eventually we get stars. So we get enough gas coming together and attracting itself gravitationally that um, you can get those reactions that power stars. And so the first stars are about from 400 million years after the uh, Big Bang. Um, and then a long time passes where, where the universe is, is, you know, forming more stars, forming more galaxies, still slowly expanding, still slowly cooling. Um, people study this. It's called um, large-scale structure formation or whatever. Um, but from my perspective, in the context of this talk, it's a rather boring time. And how long are we talking about? We're talking about like 9 billion years of just this happening very smoothly and very nicely. It's during these 9 billion years that the Earth is formed and our solar system is formed. Life begins on Earth, um, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but um, just towards that, you know, not in, at the, at, towards the end of those 9 billion years or whatever. Um, and then, af, af, again, at 9 billion years after the Big Bang, um, which is about 5 billion years ago from today, um, something strange happens. So the universe had been expanding kind of with the extra energy, you know, left over from, from inflation or whatever. Um, just, you know, kind of slowly, it was just plodding along. It was like, if you, um, again, if you take uh, a loaf of bread and you turn off the oven, like the heat from the oven might still cause it to bake a little bit, but just slowly, it's just the leftover, you know, the leftover heat or whatever. Um, but then something happens, the universe starts speeding up again. The expansion turns back on. Um, and we, again, just like inflation, we don't know why it turned back on. We, um, we call it dark energy. We say, oh, there's some energy that's causing, thing, that's causing the universe to expand faster and it's causing more space to, to, to force the, all the objects in the universe apart or whatever. Um, so we call it dark energy. That, that sounds like it makes, I mean, it sounds like mysterious or whatever, which it is but it also sounds like maybe it's something that we know a lot about, which it's not. Um, and, and that's currently where we're at now. We're in the dark energy phase of the universe. Um, it's, the universe is expanding, stuff is getting farther apart, galaxies are moving farther apart from, from other faraway galaxies. And the rate that that's happening is, is increasing. Things are moving apart faster. So I could give a whole talk on that, but I'm not going to, because we're not, we're not talking about dark energy too much. And just for the record, the universe is 14 billion years old. Um, so the questions and the problems are, you know, what caused inflation? Why did it stop? What is dark energy? Maybe it's the same as inflation. Maybe it's not. No one really knows. Um, it's happening a lot slower. Um, so that's something. Um, but then obviously, what reactions could account for the imbalance between matter and antimatter? Um, so uh, like the universe today, uh, I have my eye on the clock. And so I'm going to start speeding up. Uh, a little bit. Um, and I guess unlike the universe today, I know why I'm doing that. So um, I, I, as we talk about these imbalances, I want to just give a note on like physics culture. So uh, we, like, we like simplicity. I think a lot of people like simplicity or whatever. Um, we kind of go at it with like, uh, uh, you know, the fire of a thousand suns, like things have to be simple. Um, and, and one reason is that the math gets really hard really fast if things aren't very, very simple. Um, so for example, when antimatter was first discovered, everyone just assumed that it behaved exactly the same way. After they measured, the mass was the same and the charge was equal and opposite or whatever. Like, oh, maybe everything's just the same. And the equations work out quite nicely when matter and antimatter are exactly the same. Um, if there's any difference, then it spoils the picture, right? Um, so when I go through this, this second part, um, I, I, you're going to hear a hope in my voice. Oh, maybe antimatter and matter are the same or whatever, but they're not, right? We know that they're not. And we know that if the universe is the way that we see it today, it has to be an, it has to be an imbalance. So there's kind of this clash between hoping for a balance 
because of the simplicity of the picture and hoping for an imbalance so that we end up with the right universe. Okay? Um, and, and, okay, great. So, again, we, we know that there's an imbalance in the universe, and we thought that antimatter would behave the same as, as matter. Um, but, so, so people were stumped. Um, and this was basically from the 1920s and 30s until the 50s. People were like, oh, well, something happened. We don't know. Whatever. Inflation was not around yet. People didn't know about inflation yet. So we didn't have lots of answers to these questions. Um, the first sign of an imbalance was uh, discovered in 1956 by Chen Sheng Wu, um, who's a Chinese immigrant who studied at Berkeley and Caltech and was a professor at Columbia. Um, so someone after my own heart, or I guess I'm after her heart, if you will. Um, she discovered that there was a difference between matter and antimatter. She was the first person to do so, and she was skipped over for the Nobel Prize in favor of two of her male colleagues um, who are also involved in the project. And so I just also want to take a minute to appreciate that in the context of what's going on today in our country. So, um, you know, these, these kinds of things have, have consequences, um, you know, uh, xenophobia, uh, racism, misogyny, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because, because some of our biggest discoveries about how we came to be the way that we are were discovered, you know, by people who, who, you know, the, the patriarchy would have you believe aren't really worth paying attention to. Um, okay. And this is a picture of her by the experiment. Great. So, um, what is the neutrino? So this is again, the kind of out of nowhere or whatever, but her discovery involved the neutrino. Um, and so, uh, you can think of it you know, as the particle that breaks and or solves all of our problems. Um, so depending on, depending on whether you are an experimentalist who sees weird data or a theorist who tries to explain it, the neutrino is breaking everything or solving everything, right? Um, the neutrino is a type of subatomic particle. It's very light. It's, for a long time, we thought that they were totally massless, like light particles, um, photons. Uh, but now we just know they're very, very light. They don't feel the electric force. They're neutral and they're small, and they were named by an Italian. So that's how you get neutrino. Um, uh, they're often called the ghost particle. If you like, read in the in the Science Times article that we sent around, they call them ghostly particles with ethereal whatever. Lots of you know words meaning ooh nothing because they because they're neutral. They don't interact with atoms. You know through the electric force. So they just fly through walls. They fly through the planet, through stars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, there are three types of neutrinos, which we call flavors. Um, the electron, the muon, and the tau. You don't need to remember that, but you'll hear me talk about it once or twice more. Um, and they have anti antiparticle partners. So there's three corresponding flavors of antineutrino. The electron antineutrino, the muon antineutrino, and the tau antineutrino. Okay? Neutrinos have a property called spin. A lot of particles have this property. Actually, the only particle that doesn't is the Higgs boson, which you might have heard of. All the other fundamental subatomic particles have spin. The spin of a neutrino can only be in two directions. It can either be in the same direction that the neutrino is moving, or it could be in the opposite direction. So you could think of it as forwards or backwards. In physics, we talk about it as right-handed and left-handed. Okay? Um, so a forward-spinning neutrino is called right-handed, and a backward-spinning is called left-handed. You might wonder, what does the spin mean or whatever? And basically, you can think of it as we measure a particle spin by looking at how it bounces off other particles, the same way that you can look at a tennis ball spin by how it bounces off the court surface, top spin or back spin or whatever. Okay. So uh, CS Wu discovered that neutrinos only are left-handed. There are no right-handed neutrinos in our universe that we could find. Um, and and Antineutrinos are only right-handed. So there's no left-handed antineutrinos. So as a lefty, I'm very happy that the matter universe is left-handed. Um, but this is a huge deal because it meant that, that matter and antimatter aren't exactly the same. Because if they were, then we would have left-handed antineutrinos and right-handed neutrinos. But we don't. So this was very cool. And you might be wondering, OK, so how does the spin of a neutrino imp impact the early universe and the balance and whatever? Right? So, so we're going to get there. It's going to be, that's the part that we still don't really know. Right? That's, that's, so that's the unsatisfying part. But we're getting there. We're finding hints and leads, right? So again, with an eye on the clock, you might, you might be thinking, okay, well, you can, you can say, all right, well, there's no left-handed antineutrinos, right? You've got the left-handed neutrino, the right-handed antineutrino. But what if we just put things in a mirror? 
So what if we say, all right, well, matter isn't the same as antimatter, but it's the same as antimatter in a mirror, right? Because then the antimatter goes in a mirror and it switches handedness, right? Is the left hand in a mirror is a right hand. So, so for a while, people, again, this is the culture of physics. People are like, all right, well, it's not so simple, but maybe it's secondarily simple. Maybe it's that we just have to put everything in a mirror too, um, okay? And this is called CP symmetry. It's a, it's a technical term or whatever. The C refers to the neutrinos versus antineutrinos, and the P refers to a mirror. And why those letters are used for those abbreviations or whatever is beyond the, the, the scope of this talk. Um, but um, so maybe neutrinos obey CP symmetry. And if they do, then yeah, they preserve the balance. Sorry. Yeah, if you can, sorry, if you can mute the person on the phone again. Oh, yeah. Let's get that person. Sorry. Muted. Thank you. No problem. Oh, they're hopping around my list. OK, I caught them. So um, right. And so if, if this symmetry is, is still is followed, if you can just take antiparticles, put them in a mirror, and it works out the same, then your, 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 your hoped for imbalance is gone because an, an antiparticle in a mirror is still an antiparticle. So if you're trying to, to get rid of all the antiparticles, it doesn't help to put them in a mirror, right? So, so, so you actually, you need, you need particles that break CP symmetry, that don't follow the first we swap the particle and antiparticle and then we put them in a mirror. It need, they, that also needs to have an imbalance um, because, because otherwise we'd just have a bunch of, you know, left-handed antiparticles flying around, but they would still annihilate. So that would not be good. Okay. Right. If C, okay. So I just said this. I got ahead of myself. Um, if CP symmetry is obeyed, we're still forced into a balance. Um, so the jury is still out on neutrinos and CP. Um, this is what the article was saying. It was saying, oh, we've discovered maybe a hint that CP is broken for neutrinos. We know that CP is broken in certain other types of particles. Um, but again, like I was saying, we count it all up and it's not enough to get the imbalance that we see. Um, so that's why everyone's so excited about the neutrinos because like I said, they're like the ghost particle and they fix and or solve, uh, fix and or break all the, all the, all the problems, right? So, um, so there's a lot of hope and, and frankly, a lot of money right now being put into, you know, whether neutrinos are the answer to, to this matter antimatter and balance. Um, and um, right, so, so, so do we want CP symmetry to be broken or do we like it? I've been talking about it both ways. I've been saying, oh, people were hoping that maybe this other symmetry would be satisfied. And again, they're hoping it because their life gets a lot more difficult with all the equations and with, with also like the elegance, right? Like it'd be nice if the universe had this balance and had this equality, right? Um, had this symmetry. But like, if we want it to explain how we got to be here, then we need it to be broken. So there's like a, um, you know, two sides kind of thing that you have to kind of hold in yourself um, in terms of your hopes and dreams for CP symmetry, um, which maybe now all of you have and you didn't know that you had. Um, so, okay, I got ahead of myself again. So, um, so now in, in the last in the last negative two minutes because I'm already over. Um, what is it about neutrinos that we're hoping is different from antineutrinos, right? In these experiments that were just reported um, for the CP violation. So I, I already talked about how CS Wu discovered that there's the left-handed and the right-handed, right? And that, that they don't that you never you never have the wrong handedness on your neutrinos, right? But um, what is it now? What is the property that's different? So normally, again, this, is the this could be the subject of an entire hour long talk or whatever, but I'm, so I'm just gonna go through it really quickly. So this, this picture, this diagram, which you saw if you read the Nature article, um, it, it shows how, again, there's three different flavors of neutrinos and three different flavors of antineutrinos. And they're shown here. So this V is the Greek letter nu, which is the abbreviation for neutrino, which is always really fun when you're trying to type a neutrino and you just push it, put a V instead because um, we don't have Greek keyboards. Um, and so there's the new E and this is the Greek letter mu. So a new mu and the new tau. Um, so those are the three matter versions of the neutrino. And then there's the three antimatter versions of the neutrino. And this is a weird diagram, which is trying to 
illustrate, you know, a, a physical principle or whatever without giving you any background at all into it or whatever, but they're doing the best they can. Um, so uh, when you start with one type of a neutrino, you don't always end up like later, like if you wait an hour or whatever, you don't always end up with the same type of neutrino. They change from one type to another. Um, and we call, this, we call this phenomenon oscillation. So we say neutrinos oscillate. Um, and they oscillate from one flavor to another. Um, and I'm not going to go into why or how or whatever, but basically these, these wavy curves are trying to illustrate like how, how much of a chance how much of a chance the neutrino has of being one flavor versus another. And so when they all line up, it's one flavor. And when they're all opposites, it's another flavor. When they're kind of half and half, it's a third flavor. Okay? And, and the question that we're trying to answer about what's different between neutrinos and antineutrinos is, does it take the same time for a neutrino to oscillate from one flavor to another as an antineutrino to oscillate from one flavor to another? Um, it's, which sounds like a very subtle question, and it is a very subtle question. The prediction for like the difference in how long it would take is like very, very minuscule. So we have to build really sensitive experiments and take a lot, a lot of data to try to get at this very subtle difference. Um, the reason why we think there might even plausibly, like why would you even assume that it's possible for there to be a difference in the timing or whatever, is that um, there's another type of particle that also oscillates. Um, it's called a quark, which you might have heard of. And quarks oscillate. Um, and we know that one of the other sources of CP violation is, is from quarks. So we know there's already another system that does this. And so it's possible, you know, just by coincidence or whatever, that maybe neutrinos don't, right? There's no reason that because quarks do it, neutrinos have to. But it's a, you know, we're trying to look for a pattern again. We're trying to look for for something that will make our lives a little simpler in, in analyzing this. And so we think that maybe because quarks do, maybe neutrinos also do. So that's why we're looking for it in neutrinos. Um, and um, if, you're, if you're really following really closely, you might be wondering, well, hold on, but this is only matter going to matter going to matter. So, or, or antimatter going to antimatter going to antimatter. So how, you know, even if they're at, working at different times or whatever, how are we possibly going to get a difference in the amount of matter from the amount of antimatter? Because all these oscillations don't change the number of matter particles versus the number of antimatter particles. And unfortunately, that's going to have to be one of the things that you're unsatisfied with at the end of this talk. Because there is, there is a way, um, but it's, it's sort of beyond the scope of this talk, although I'm happy to discuss it in our later sessions if, if people are curious or whatever. Um, but, um, but, you know, the, just the fact that there's a difference is already very promising, right? If you're trying to, if you're trying to get an imbalance, you need there to be a difference and then you need there to be a way to, to, to get the imbalance. Because if there was no difference, then you'd never get an imbalance, even if it was technically possible. So, so, okay. So what does this all mean? Again, to summarize, the universe was created in a balanced state because of inflation. Inflation forced everything to be balanced. The laws of physics favor matter over antimatter very slightly. We already know that from these other quarks, right? But it's not enough to create the imbalance that we observe. So we need to find more types of reactions or interactions or particles that increase the imbalance. And maybe it's neutrinos. And we don't know. We're not satisfied. And I hope you're not satisfied also. Um, as you're, as you're thinking about, you know, what I've just, you know, talked about over the next week, um, waiting for your own talk, which I'm very looking forward to, um, think about, you know, these different things in the context of how you see the universe and what you think, you know, should be the right answer, um, what you hope is the right answer. Um, so like the idea of matter versus antimatter, like that, that every, every type of particle has a, has a partner and that most of them are pretty much the same, but there's some slight differences, right? Um, the beginning of the universe, like what was happening, it was like really hot and dense and it started expanding. All these processes happened, they turned on, they turned off. We don't really know why, what's up with that, right? Um, inflation is one of them. Um, the idea of wiping the slate clean at the start of the universe. Um, uh, symmetry, right? So balance and symmetry, that things should behave the same way in different situations. Um, the culture of physics, hoping 
that there's a balance versus hoping that the balance is broken. Um, and how physicists study the early universe, which I've said very little about other than to mention that Charlie is a person and he studies telescopes. Um, but, um, but, you know, I, I, I've talked about stuff that happened, you know, almost 14 billion years ago. How do we know all that stuff, right? I know in some of Yaron's readings, he talks about like passing on knowledge and, and, and discovering new knowledge and stuff like that. So that's something which I didn't really touch on but I'm very happy to, um, you know, discuss in our, in our later seminars. So um, thank you so much for your time and attention and for staying on mute. Uh, <laughs> and um, I'm, you know, uh, very, very excited to see where this conversation leads. Uh, and Sam, you. if you could um, um, end screen share for a moment, we can all see each other. Yes. Thank you. And and um, before we um, end the session, also, if you could just take a look at the questions just so that you have them for uh, future oh, yes. I don't, I, Not that you need to respond to them now, but just to harvest them into the next. And um, if we, maybe we could take just a minute or two before, if it's all right, if we can, we had a slightly late start, but even so, maybe take a few minutes if there are, um, um, I don't know if anyone, I, I don't know if this is opening up Pandora's box to see if anyone wants to voice a question. And, and I, it would have to be short and because time is short. And, and, and Alan, if you want to unmute yourself. Sam, thank you. Um, is it possible that there's a sampling error uh, by physicists of the universe for example, if we looked at the ocean, we would find differences in salinity at different parts of the ocean around the world. Is it possible that there are parts of the universe that have more or less of the stuff that's missing and that, and that the uh, problem is one of sampling error? That's a really good question. And for a long time, people thought that maybe that was the way out. Um, it's called, you can, you can, if you want to Google this, you can look for antimatter domains. That's what they're called, antimatter domains. Um, you'll find a lot of, you know, technical articles. There's not a lot of, of sort of easy stuff written about this, but you, you should certainly look it up. Um, the answer is, if you have an antimatter domain, we know we live in a matter domain. Maybe that's the whole universe is just one matter domain. Maybe there's other domains, right? So, so you, that's a very good question to ask. Um, if there's, an, if there's a domain out there that's in our universe that's made of antimatter, there's got to be a boundary, right? Because we're in a matter domain. If there's some other antimatter domain, there's a boundary where our domain ends and their domain begins. And if there's a boundary, then that means that there's a meeting place for the matter to meet with the antimatter, right? Maybe it's in outer space, so it doesn't happen very frequently. It's very, there's not a lot of particles out in outer space, right? But, um, but, in any event, you would expect that every so often a matter and an antimatter particle would meet each other at that domain boundary and annihilate, right? And so we've looked for, a, for gamma rays and radiation coming from domain boundaries, and we haven't found any. So, so it's a very good question, and you know, everyone had that question. For, for you know, all the scientists and whatnot had that question. We went and we looked, and we didn't find anything. So we've pretty much ruled that out now. Um, yeah. Um, I want to answer, uh, Myra asked a question in the chat, how is left-handed and right-handed defined and why is it labeled that way? So this is a good one. Um, right. Well, I said, okay, so if the, if the spin is in the same direction as the motion, then it's, uh, left-handed. And if it's in the opposite direction, then it's, oh, sorry, if it's the same direction, it's right-handed. It's in the opposite direction. It's left-handed. So, so, um, we, we, we usually learn this, this in high school physics. You might, you, and if you took uh, high school physics, you might've learned about the right hand rule. So, so in, in um, so people haven't, so, okay. So, so, so um, in when, uh, you know, as I've been implying or whatever, and as you might have thought about from like a, um, looking in a mirror or whatever, you can't take uh, your left hand and rotate it or whatever so that it looks exactly the same as your right hand. You can put them together like this, but they're backwards, right? There's one is facing one way, one's facing the other, right? 
So there's two different ways that you can set up your, your, um, your reference and your, your, your universe, right? You can either have your palm facing this way and your thumb facing at you, right? Or you can have your palm facing this way and your thumb facing at you. And so one is left-handed and one is right-handed, right? So in physics, we use the right-hand convention. So when we do our, when we set up our X, Y, Z axis, right, et cetera, et cetera, we always use the convention from the right hand, okay? Um, and, and so when we're talking about uh, spin, um, we, use the, we use the right hand convention. So if something is going around in circles like um, this, this way, right, you can all see, I'm not, I'm not gonna use directions because I don't know whether my video is mirrored or not, right? So that's just gonna confuse the heck out of everyone. But this is my right hand, okay? Just trust me on that. So if something is spinning this way, I can follow that spin with my right hand and my thumb points into the camera, okay? So if a particle is spinning this way and moving into the camera, we say it is right-handed, okay? If, if a particle is spinning the other way and moving away from the camera, then it's the same, it's just the particle's been rotated or your camera's been moved. But if it's spinning the other way, spinning the other way, and going into the camera, then you need your left hand, right? But that's, that, that's, that's the other convention, right? So, so we only use the right hand. So if it's going the right hand way, the right way with your thumb, we say it's right-handed. And if it's going the other way, we say it's left-handed, okay? So it's just, it, you can literally use your hands to figure out whether your particle is right-handed or left-handed, which is pretty neat. Um, okay. Um, is, oh, the other, is looking for the imbalance or extra matter part of the work for the Large Hadron Collider? Yes, it is. Um, it's not, it's not, you know, there's like 3,000 people on each on two different experiments that are looking for this kind of thing at the Large Hadron Collider. There's also, oh, there's three of the four experiments at the Large Hadron Collider are involving themselves at least somewhat with this question. Um, so actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring up a logo for one of the experiments on screen share. And you'll see, um, you'll see that this one is actually sort of primarily dedicated. If you look at the logo, come on, logo, here it is. Okay, screen share. So the experiment's name is LHCB. Um, LHC is Large Hadron Collider, and B is because they study the B particle. And you all can see this, and you see that their logo is a mirror, right? It's the text mirrored. Um, and if you look at CB upside down, it says CP, which you might recognize as that symmetry, right? And there's a slash through it. So the mirror universe is not the same as the real, you know, as the, as the actual universe, right? And so there's a slash. So, so the LHCB is studying this, you know, very uh, intently. They don't study neutrinos, though. They study the other types of systems that have CP violation. Um, so, yeah, so the LHC is studying this. Awesome. This is probably a good place to pause. I'm mean, not to stop, but to pause. And, and I was thinking coming into this, like the, our world is crazy around us and our country is burning. And we don't know, we, we really, it's so out of balance. And I thought first, what comfort I would get from moving all that to the side for a moment and engaging in learning together and how wonderful that is. And then I also, as I mentioned coming into it, we think about matter and antimatter and what's going to shift the balance um, to something and so that something wins and feeling that so much of what Sam spoke about and the Aaron will continue with and we think about all those things. We think about and dark energy and we think about, um, I, mean, I, I can't begin to say, first of all, I want to say, wow, and this is also crazy and so wonderful. And, and I don't know which um, research scientist uh, said this, that, but that we can understand the universe because we're, we are made of it. Um, I don't know who said that, but uh, Sam, thank you for allowing, giving us the respect that we really could begin to understand this. Yes. So everyone is welcome to applaud. This is wonderful. <laughs> it's awesome. Thank really, you so much. It's been so a much. pleasure. And, and your friend Charlie is welcome to um, 
and join us and to contribute also. And we'll see everyone, if not before, we'll see you next week at this time. And have a good week, a safe week, and more light than dark. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. And Sam, I think you have to end the call for us. Oh, yes. Let's do that. <laughs> everyone can leave anytime you want. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.